All right, folks. Uh, glad to be here. Sorry for my outfit. I'm wearing flip flops, but um, that's I guess the California spirit, and uh, <laughs> won't be apologizing for it too much. Um, so I'll, yes, I'll be talking about uh, using uh, optical microscopy, mostly nonlinear optical methods, for visualizing tissues and what kind of things are important when you do that. Got some kind of notions that come to the fore uh, that we need to talk about. So. Uh, it is microscopy what I'm talking about, okay? And of course, microscopy is meant to take images. <clears throat> now, the quickest way you can take an image, as you all know, is to simply illuminate the sample, okay? And you can do that from the top or from the bottom with light through the microscope objective, which is the heart and soul of the microscope. And then just see what comes back and project that through your imaging system onto a camera. So literally, it's a form of magnified photography, if you wish. The camera can be a little bit more sensitive. Your optics are a little bit more optimized, a little bit more achromatic, some field corrections, and so forth. But in the end, it is photography, OK? You take an image of an object that you're interested in. So we'll not be talking about this. We'll be talking about this, which is not using just any light source, but using a laser to illuminate your sample. As you know, laser has uh, very peculiar properties, and that uh, is that the light is collimated, the photons are coherent in time and in space, which means they basically follow the same path. You get a laser beam that diverges just only slightly. And if you, if you send the laser beam through an objective lens, a fully correct objective lens, something magical happens. You guys know that, and it has been said before, but I cannot stress it enough because it is a remarkable thing that we can do it with such high precision. We can focus that light to a really tiny spot, which is the fractional limited spot. And with a laser beam and with a high numerical aperture lens that you buy from manufacturers nowadays, which are very well engineered, very well engineered, you can really hit that diffractional limit without any real problem nowadays. Okay, back in the day, there was a huge problem. The first microscopes were riddled with aberrations and imperfections, but nowadays, we reach theoretical limits with off-the-shelf objective lenses. So we can take these, this laser beam in combination with these beautiful lenses, and we reach these theoretical limits of focusing. Very nice. We take it for granted, but actually there's, a, there's years and years of technology and thinking behind it. So what you, what you have then, instead of having a whole plane that's illuminated, you have one spot that's illuminated, one spot only, and that's where the signal comes from, OK? And so you can detect that with a very sensitive detector, not with a camera, but with a, for instance, a photomultiplier or a very, very sensitive photodiode. And then if you want to take an image, you have to move that spot around rapidly, very rapidly, if you want to do any serious tissue imaging. Okay, so these two modes are fundamentally different. One is wide field illumination, the other is point scanning or laser scanning microscopy. So uh, that image, uh, drives the point home that you have to move the focal spot around rapidly to take an image. OK, so these focal fields are important. I think Vassan already pointed it out, and it will be illuminated also uh, later on in this uh, workshop. These focal fields are uh, the key to a laser scanning microscopy, to taking those very beautiful images. Uh, it is important to realize that these focal fields have an amplitude, but also a phase. Okay, because it's an electromagnetic field, they have an amplitude and a phase. And typically, if you do imaging, you don't really care about the phase so much. But in some modalities, some of them I'll be touching on today, it actually does matter. Okay, the phase of the field is an important ingredient, as is the amplitude. Now, uh, the width of such a field is about 0.3 microns, 300 nanometers or so. And uh, the length is about a micron, so those are numbers that you may have heard about, but if you haven't, keep them in mind because those are the spatial dimensions that we will be dealing with. Now, here's a, such a focus, light that is focused to so, such a small spot, but of course the spot doesn't materialize out of nowhere because the light first has to travel to the spot to actually be condensed and then it will diverge again. So the light is everywhere, below here and above, it's just more concentrated in the middle. And of course, if you take any plane, any slice along that cone, then you realize that 
the number of photons that travel through this little slice are as many as they travel through that slide, because it's the same photons, okay? So that's what this slide is trying to tell you, that if you take any slide there, the integration is the same. It's the same number of photons. So they're just distributed over a larger area, and here over a smaller area. Why do I say this? Because if you do regular imaging, that is what's going to be limiting you, believe it or not. If you do regular confocal microscopy, for instance, or regular fluorescence microscopy, I should say, this will be a problem to you. Here you see some cells in tissue. They are illuminated they are with laser scanning microscopy. Okay, so we're scanning this laser beam across. And this is what we should be seeing, or we want to see, but in, in fact, we see this. We see a blurry image, and that's because, well, the light is, has to travel through the tissue, and on, the, on its way, it will excite fluorophores, let's say, and they will luminesce or fluoresce. And they will reach the detector, and so we get, from every plane, we get a little bit of signal, not just the image plane, this thin slice that we're interested in. So to do, of course, that, to make it better, and this is something you probably already know, but I just want to make sure everybody understands, uh, you, can, you have to implement a way to limit either your excitation or your detection to this, this very small area that you're interested in. I'm only interested from photons from this middle part, not from here and there. So I can do two things. One, I can excite everything, but just make sure that on my detection side, I only detect those photons that were excited in the middle part, in the focal volume right there, okay? And if I reject everything else through detection, I don't have to worry about those parts. I say, well, my signal just comes from that middle part, and that defines my resolution. Uh, what we do in nonlinear optical microscopy is not to do it on the detection side, but on the excitation side, okay? We make sure that the, pho that the photons will not excite fluorophores or chromophores or any molecule that is below or above this focal volume, okay? So in nonlinear uh, microscopy, the fields are confined so tightly, and because there's a nonlinear interaction, the interaction only takes place where the confinement is the highest, and if you stray away from it, the confinement is low here, there's not enough intensity to elicit this nonlinearity, and therefore the signal will simply not be coming from those places, only from the middle part, which is what we want. Okay. So, this is an, uh, just an example. I think you've seen these images before, but just to illustrate, confocal microscopy can give you beautiful images, and uh, two-photon microscopy or three-photon microscopy can do the same. Okay? In both cases, you have confinement. Confocal, it's on the detection side. With nonlinear optical microscopy, it's on the excitation side. Okay? So, distinguish those two properties from one another. Okay, so we have this capability, great, and it's especially great for tissue imaging. Why? Because tissues are thick. So you need to have a mechanism to confine your observation only to the focal volume and not to the parts above and below, because the tissue is thick, so you will see everything. By the way, for cellular samples, like a glass slide with cells on it, Confocal microscopy only gives you limited advantages because the cells are only a few microns tall. So there isn't really a lot of material above and below. Right? So the, the cells themselves are already sliced because of their thickness. They're very thin. But in tissues, that's not so. In tissues, you need some kind of mechanism to enhance the resolution along the optical axis. So this is all good and well, but uh, we also realize that these are just ideal cases, because in reality, the confocal, the, the, the volume that we want to, uh, to create, this beautiful confined spot where everything happens, is not always confined, okay? Things happen to it. So we have to think about what happens if light propagates through tissue. This will be a very important part, of course, of this workshop. It's all about how light propagates through tissues and how we can manage and understand those phenomena. This is very important also for us. Anytime you use an objective lens to focus the light to a tiny spot, anything that will ruin that tiny spot 
will affect the quality of the image. So tissue scattering is absolutely essential in laser scanning microscopy and nonlinear optical scanning microscopy. So here's the tissue with some chunks in it, okay? And our goal is to create a very well-behaved focal spot that is the smallest possible. And um, these chunks that sit there, these changes in refractive index in the tissue, will not make things better. Although, some smart people that can shape wavefronts can actually make use of these chunks to make sure they get a tinier spot. But that's a whole different story. If you don't have such technologies like spatial light modulators, which typical microscopes do not have, then all these little refractive index changes in your sample will deteriorate, not make better, but deteriorate the quality of your focal volume. So the incoming light is going to be affected, okay? Um, because the incoming light is affected, the focal volume is not nicely confined. That means that the signal that emanates from it emanates from a larger volume, okay? So it is different from the situation if the, there are not such refractive index changes in a tissue. Okay, and then the third effect is the light that is generated from this distorted volume here also has to propagate out. It has to propagate through the tissue again, and some of these photons will encounter those objects and therefore change their path, and therefore on the detection side, you're also affected. So tissue scattering affects basically nonlinear optical microscopy and laser scanning microscopy in general in three ways. One, light going in is affected. Two, because it's affected, the focal volume is larger, the signal generation is therefore different. And three, the light also has to come out, right? So we have to take note of all of those stages of uh, how scattering affects our, uh, our imaging capabilities. So in confocal microscopy, what we do, we basically, the only thing we do is we can confine things on the detection side, okay? So our excitation side is th things are still messed up. But we apply this mask, okay? So this is the real distorted focal volume, all right? But we apply a mask on the detection side. So photons that kind of like scatter out in all kinds of directions are rejected, okay? We don't see them because we only see the photons that are confined to the original <coughs> focal volume. Okay, so those photons that are basically take, taking alternative paths are rejected. The photons that follow the paths that are stipulated by diffraction theory without those chunks of material in a tissue, those are the ones that the confocal detector will see. So, you actually do a pretty good job. However, you lose a truckload of photons, okay? Because a lot of photons will be affected, all right? So there's a, a tremendous signal loss in confocal microscopy due to tissue scattering. In nonlinear optical microscopy, we do things on the excitation side. There's no rejection of photons that come back, okay? So we come in, our focus is again distorted, so it's longer typically, worse, it's broader and a lot longer than the unaffected focal volume. And then the photons that make it out of the focal volume they scatter all about, but we try to capture all of them, okay? We don't apply any mask on the detection side. We're saying only these should be detected. We also detect those. So the advantage is of doing nonlinear optical microscopy, you don't lose those photons, right? Because we don't apply a detection mask. So you get many, many more photons coming to your detector as you have a confocal microscopy. That can be a really, really big advantage in tissue imaging. So knowing optical microscopy benefits from that. You don't apply a restriction at the detection side. In addition, we also apply light of, lo of a longer wavelength, which I will come back to in a few moments, which propagates typically a little bit uh, deeper into the tissue because it's less affected by refractive index changes. So why would you do nonlinear optical microscopy? Okay. Well, one of the the advantage is, is that, and I'll emphasize this in the next couple of slides, that you can generate molecular contrast of endo endogenous molecules in a tissue. 
typically in confocal fluorescence, you, you have a limited set of options, okay? So it is based on, typically, on labeling. The penetration depth in nonlinear optical microscopy is, used, is a little higher because we use wavelengths, excitation wavelengths, that are longer than in confocal microscopy. Okay, so confocal microscopy typically uses light that is bluer, which scatters more, and in analog microscopy we use redder light, which scatters less. Okay, it has intrinsic 3D resolution. In linear microscopy, you need a detection mask, which may reject photons. Okay, which is this point right here. And then finally, which is not so good, um, photo damaging. Okay, we, we send in pulse light, which is uh, inducing nonlinear optical processes, but also nonlinear optical damaging processes. So that's not good. But the, but the advantage is that that kind of damaging only happens in the focus, because outside you cannot really induce nonlinear optical. Um, processes. So the photo damaging due to nonlinearities only happens in photon in focus as well. Linear photo damaging happens throughout the entire illumination cone. Okay, so if we do linear microscopy, even confocal, you are still bleaching your sample everywhere. Not just in the focus, but everywhere. So you lose signal by scanning through the sample, you lose signal everywhere, not just from your focal plane, but also above and below. Okay. So like I said, photo damaging can be very significant in focus if you use analog microscopy, and that's why you have to tailor your excitation light. You cannot put too much light on. Uh, linear microscopy uses CW light, not pulse light, and therefore we don't have those nonlinear optical damaging mechanisms. So that's an advantage, actually. Nonlinear optical microscopy is also expensive. You need a lot of money. Confocal microscopy is also expensive, but just less. Okay, so less expensive. All right, so now let's look at some basics of nonlinear optic microscopy after advertising to you that it actually has some advantages. What exactly is it then? Well, it's very simple. Nonlinear optical signals depend nonlinearly on the excitation intensity. That is the key. All right? Some people say there's all kinds of nonlinearities, but in Nonlinear optical microscopy, we define the nonlinearity simply through the intensity to a certain power. If this power is larger than one, then you're dealing with a nonlinear optical process. Now, there's many forms, right? For instance, I can have a process that depends to the second order of the intensity of light that you put in, or something like this. I can send in two beams beam one and beam two, and the process that happens depends on both. So the signal depends on the intensity of beam one and intensity of beam two, which is nonlinear. Okay? It's linear in each of them, but it's nonlinear overall. So this is also a nonlinear process. And as you know, uh, the nonlinear microscopy does the confinement on the excitation side. So once again, this is the same kind of visualization, slightly different. This image is famous, okay, but it does, it is just a beautiful image and it just, make the, just it makes the points beautifully that this tiny spot right here is what happens in nonlinear optical microscopy excitation. Well, in linear, you have this whole cone that responds, okay? So it's a dramatic difference, dramatic difference. Okay, so, uh, what kind of nonlinearities do you have, and what kind of nonlinearities do people use? So here's a microscope, and if you send lasers in there and you focus those to a small spot, then a whole bunch of nonlinearities happen. Okay? It's up to you which you would like to detect. So if you send in two laser beams, two pulse laser beams, you will be generating cars. If you change the detection a little bit, you'll be detecting a different process called stimulated Raman scattering. This is some frequency generation microscopy, which is related to second harmonic generation microscopy. They both are sensitive to non-central symmetries in the sample. Two photon excitation microscopy right there, detected through fluorescence. You can also do palm probe microscopy. All of these processes depend nonlinearly on the incoming light. We'll see some examples of this. All right, so 
what exactly is this nonlinearity? Yes. This is too easy so far. I'm going to make it a little bit more difficult. A little bit more difficult. Because, you know, nonlinear optical microscopy depends on nonlinear optical processes. But what is exactly a nonlinear optical process? I mean, what is actually happening? Who knows what is happening? I mean, why can a molecule produce light in a nonlinear fashion? What does that do to? Does anybody have any ideas? We know it happens, but why? What do you think? Operations, yeah, could be involved, could or could not be involved. It's not the fundamental reason why we have a nonlinearity. Let me first explain to you what a nonlinear, what we understand as being nonlinear. Okay? So, if you think, let's let's bring back the molecule. Here's a molecule, simple molecule. Light comes in. Okay. Light is electromagnetic radiation. It has an E field and a B field, okay? Magnetic and electric field. Um, what happens if such a field hits a molecule? What does a molecule do? It does something, right? Something starts to move. Now, if the, the electric field and magnetic field actually act, interact differently with a molecule, because the magnetic field has a very weak interaction with the molecule, okay? A lot weaker, actually. On the field level, 137 times weaker. And if you square that, you get almost nothing. Okay, so the B field is a lot, weak, uh, a lot weaker in terms of its interaction with the molecule. The electric field interacts with the molecule quite dramatically. There is electrons here, okay? And there's also nuclei. Nuclei are positively charged. The electrons are negatively charged. What happens if you send an um, electron between two plates, a plus and a minus? The electron starts to move. If this is plus, this is minus, the electron starts to move to which side? Plus side. Okay? The electron is negatively charged, goes to the positive side. If I switch this plate the other way around, it moves the other way. Right? If I switch this plate very fast, let's say at the optical frequency, the electron goes a little moves very fast. It moves with the optical frequency. It wiggles, right? So this guy has electrons. So these electrons will wiggle as well. They wiggle with the frequency of the optical light, simply because they're charged and there's an electric field whizzing by. The, the nuclei are also charged, so they could also respond. But they will respond much slower and sometimes do not move at all because the frequency of that light is too high. And that's especially the case when the frequency is in the visible or in the near infrared. However, if the wavelength is going to be longer, the frequency is going to be slower, then the nuclei start to move as well. Okay? Because they're charged, and they can move with the electric field as well. So, things start to move around. If things start to move around, they move. And if you're a physicist, every motion is captured into harmonic motion. Okay? A harmonic oscillator. A harmonic oscillator has a potential, simply means, a displacement, and this is the potential energy well. It basically indicates how difficult it is to move the particle as a function of distance. This is the electron. If I move the electron farther out, the more I push it out, the more difficult it becomes. Right? That's why the electron likes to sit here, in the middle, on average. But it wiggles like this. The larger the extension, the more difficult and the more force I need to exert to get the electron to move farther away from its equilibrium position. Now, if you move an electron away from its equilibrium position, you change things, okay? So if I move it out, let's say this is a positive charge of the nucleus, the electron is here, so it's overall neutral, but if I move it out, this becomes a little bit more positive, this is a little, more, little bit more negative. That means you create a dipole. You create a polarization, okay? And the polarization goes like this. If I move this electron away, the polarization goes up. And interestingly, if you have a harmonic potential, the polarization changes linearly. The farther you are moving the electron out, the larger the polarization. Okay? Now, here it comes. Here's my field. Remember, I'm wiggling the electron. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Okay? It's starting to shake in this harmonic well. 
And now the polarization is starting to change. It wiggles too, right? It wiggles with the optical frequency. So the polarization in the material looks like this. It shakes. I get positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. It goes at the optical frequency. So my, my material becomes polarized dynamically. It shakes. OK, that's basically linear, a linear response of the material. But if my field is very strong, OK, then I'm able to move the electron farther out. And I'm able, able to sense parts of the potential that are no longer harmonic. As you know, a harmonic potential is an idealized case. I mean, nothing is purely harmonic. Typically, it's easier to drag the electron out to one side more than to another side. OK, there's some sort of asymmetry. This is true for any molecule, really. OK, at some point, if I move harder, I'll sample these parts of the potential. OK, so if you do that, what happens is something very interestingly. If you move here, it becomes easier to polarize. So the polarization is going to be larger. But if I move this way, it's harder. So it becomes smaller. Okay? So the polarization becomes asymmetric. And what you get is, if I put a field in that is perfectly harmonic and sinusoidal, I get this field out, which is, looks at first sight still sinusoidal, but it's not perfect. Because look, it's much less here than it is on that side, more negative than positive. It's truncated on one side of the wave, and it's extended on the other side. Okay, So if you look at this wave and you decompose it with a Fourier analysis, you get this. Most of it still looks like the original wave. But there's other components you need to add to it to sample such a waveform. Okay? So there's a higher order component. There's a two omega component, and a three omega, and a four omega. Okay? So I can write this as follows. The polarization I create is mostly the original wave, but with distortions, namely a second order distortion and higher order distortions. So effectively, what this thing does, it responds with a variety of frequencies. Okay? If this will be acoustic waves, you'll be hearing different tones. If this is optical, you'll be seeing different colors. Same thing. Okay? So what happens is, this wave goes in at omega. Most of it is at omega when it comes out, but some of it is at 2 omega, which simply means you have double the frequency or half the wavelength. You put 800 in, you get 400 out. That's a true nonlinear process. Now, interestingly, this process has certain symmetry properties. And it turns out that it's only non-zero if you have a non-central somatic material. This has to do with the symmetry of the potential. If the potential is really symmetric, no matter if it goes like this, it's still symmetric. Okay? It's oddly shaped, but still symmetric. This side and this side motion is still the same. You need an asymmetry. Okay? So that's why the second order process probes things that have a non central symmetry. OK, so that's a long story. But in the end, you get this. Two photons combine their energy and get one photon out at double the frequency. Right? This is actually a quantum mechanical explanation of the previous classical. Classical is moving of electrons on, in potentials. This is simply saying, aha, photon 1 plus photon 2 equals photon 3. Right? This plus this equals that. So I put in 800. I get out 400 nanometers. Now, interestingly, in such a process, this is a real state of the molecule. This could be a vibrational state of the molecule. But this dotted line, what does it mean? It's a virtual state. The virtual state means it's not an eigenstate of the material. The material cannot really stay in this state because there's no state. So what happens is you drive it up to this level, but it can't stay there. It can't hold the information. And it must instantaneously go back to the ground state. Instantaneously means within the uncertainty of the uh, time energy Heisenberg principle, which is in this case about two or three femtoseconds. Within one wave, one wave shake, it has to come back. OK, so that's second harmonic generation. Who has never seen a picture like this? 
All right? Well, here it is. That is the collagen, <laughs> collagen in the dermis, okay? And the reason why you can see it is because collagen is non-centrosymmetric, okay? Most of it is due to an achiral ordering of the collagen units. It also has a very weak chiral component. I won't go in it because it's somewhat dense. But in any case, collagen is one of the few structures in tissues that actually has this very particular property of non central symmetry, which is why you can see it almost exclusively. There's a few more. Microtubules have similar kind of properties. If a weak response, you can see them sometimes in cells with second amount of generation. Myosin is a, another structure in muscle tissue that you can see quite nicely with second amount of generation. So these are kind of fibrous structures with very kind of an achiral form of non central symmetry uh, arrangement of the units. All right, so here we have the process which is almost similar, two photons in, but here something else happens. I'm exciting a real state of the molecule. Now the molecule can hold the information, absorb the two photons, keep it there for a while, relaxes to the lowest excited state, and then releases its contents through the emission of a photon. That is, of course, a two-photon excited fluorescence process, which is famous, and everybody knows about it. Two-photon excited fluorescence microscopy is used almost in any biology lab nowadays. There's many chromophores that you can excite through this process. And the nice thing is that you can excite chromophores you typically have to excite with UV light or very blue light, which is not always pleasant to work with in tissues. But now you can do it with double, double the, um, the wavelength, okay? So you can actually excite it with wavelength that is 800 instead of 400 nanometers, which is much more beneficial for tissue imaging. Okay, so what can you see with two photon excited fluorescence? A lot of things. Things that actually fluoresce by themselves are, for instance, elastin. The elastin fibers, also in the dermis, this green here is the fluorescence, two photon excited fluorescence from elastin. Of course, NADH and also FAD, flavins, are metabolic factors that actually are autofluorescent. And they're beautiful because you can see individual cells, because cells have high concentrations of these chromophores. And interestingly, their concentration in the nucleus is a lot lower. Okay, so you can see individual cells very nicely, well demarcated. You can count the number of nuclei simply based on the concentration differences of NADH and FAD. This is actually almost as good as H and E stain, where you can see the morphology of the cell overall and especially the uh, nuclear to cytoplasmic ratios. There's more. Here, for instance, is melanin, which is a very important pigment okay, in our bodies. And it barely fluoresces. However, if you excite it with two photons, it starts to fluoresce a little bit. And you can pick it up, and you can do some spectroscopy with it. But most importantly, you can see melanocytes quite nicely in the tissue. So if you apply this to skin imaging, you see the following. All right? This is basically collecting the fluorescence and a second harmonic signal after sending in an 800 nanometer pulse laser beam. And this is a living piece of tissue. In fact, this is the tissue of somebody you may encounter this week, Bruce Stromberg. OK? <laughs> Will Bruce be doing a lecture? OK, he'll be doing a lecture later on this week. Now you know what he looks like up close. <laughs> this is him. And uh, we see here some beautiful, beautiful pieces of information. The top here is a stratum corneum, OK? This is the epidermis. This is the junction between the dermis and the epidermis. You see the basal cell layer just absolutely beautifully, right? Below it, papillar collagen. You see here already the elastin fibers. And here is really the dermal collagen underneath. There's some black spots here, which have to do with the location of the blood vessels. This is an image, again, taken without any labels on a living person and get all this information just by sending in those photons, collecting the second uh, harmonic signal and the two photon excited fluorescent signal. The keratinocytes here through the NADH fluorescence, a 
of course, the collagen through the second harmonic, and see the elastin here through the fluorescence of the elastin fibers. What you also see is that after a little while, the signal gets a little dim. Uh -huh. This distance from here to here is about 150 microns. Okay? Now, this part of the skin actually is one of the thinnest parts, let's say, over here, inside of your arm. It's a good place to, to image, but at the outside of your arm, the skin is already thicker, and you won't even see this part. Okay? You basically, it stops right there. And uh, this is not really good news, because we'd like to see what happens a little deeper in the dermal parts of a tissue, all the way to the adipose tissue. We can't really get there. And this is because, because of scattering, right? So what about this? We know that scattering is detrimental on a variety of levels. The excitation power is compromised, signal generation is different, and then the collection is also compromised in a way, right? So the first part I may be able to address by saying, okay, fine, on the way in, I'll, I'll be losing photons and my focal volume is gonna be worse, but if I just crank up the number of photons, I can still get enough photons in my focal volume to generate the signal, okay? So here I got a lot of photons, but here so many fewer that I'll lose signal, okay? But if I increase the power, maybe I get more signal back. Okay, so that is maybe a possibility. So here is my focal volume at the top, still looks nice and confined. Signal comes from there, looks nice and crisp, the image at that level. If I go deeper, you see the focal volume is a lot, lot larger in both dimensions, mostly in Z, okay, a lot worse. And because of that, the confinement is a lot, lot uh, worse, and that's why the signal is gonna be a lot dimmer, okay, from this location. So if I increase the power then, like this, boom, maybe I get the signal back. And that is true, of course. However, what happens is that the signal generated from this spot is what I collect, but if I increase the power by a lot, at some point, I'll be starting generating through this entire cone, especially here at the surface, where the incoming photon flux is actually very, very high. And so people see, in addition to the signal here, they see almost an unchanging signal from the surface, and it gives you an enormous blur. In other words, you cannot really apply this trick to enhance the contrast. Solving this problem, of course, is gonna be very important. Okay, that's why you guys are all here. Think about what you can do to remedy this. Because if, if you can, that'd be actually quite revolutionary. If you, go, if you can go deeper by a factor of two, that would be dramatic. All right. Now, let me say something about vibrational spectroscopy. We saw second harmonic generation, seeing collagen, two photon excited fluorescence, seeing NADH, elastin, a couple of other chromophores, but the list is not endless, right? Because there's only a few molecules in your body that actually respond by sending out a photon through fluorescence. Not all our molecules are fluorescent molecules. However, every molecule in our body has a vibrational uh, spectrum, a vibrational optical response. Here is a vibrational spectrum of a virus, okay? You see a lot of information in here. This axis here is ter in terms of wave numbers, which is simply an energy scale, an energy scale relevant to molecular vibrations. These vibrations here, these peaks, correspond to vibrational modes that are representative of the molecules that are in this virus, and then a very strong response here. This is the CH stretching response. This is the OH stretching of water. The bottom line is, there's a lot of information in there. If we can use that information, maybe we can use vibrational spectroscopy in addition to the other techniques to get more information about the molecules that make up the tissue. Be a little bit more specific about it. I'll skip this and show you this process. The way in which people like to do it is to uh, a Raman process, okay? Who has never heard of Raman? Most people have, okay? So you may recognize this diagram. You put one photon in, again, a virtual state, cannot stay there, and some of the photons fall actually back, not back to the ground state, but to a state a little bit above, and effectively exciting this transition, 
through this kind of like detour, okay? So instead of going from here to here, I'm going like this way, but the effect is the same. Effectively, I've excited that transition. That is a vibrational transition, okay? So by reading out the color of this light, I can get information about this transition. I just subtract this one from that, and the residual is the vibrational energy. That's what Raman spectroscopy is all about. Now, Raman is indeed a great way to map out cells and tissues. However, there's a big problem. Who knows what the problem with Raman is? Several problems. What do you think? Very weak. Yes. It's very weak. In fact, you say two things compared to fluorescence. Fluorescence is strong and is always there and can overwhelm this signal. Okay, so that's a problem if you do Raman in cells and tissues. You get always a fluorescence background that you don't want, and then on top of it, a tiny little signal that's too weak to collect. Right? So that's problematic. You need to improve it some way, somehow, and one way to do that is by using nonlinear optics. Once again, this is a diagram that involves not one, two photons, one in, one out, but actually one in, another one in, another one in, and then a fourth one out. Okay? So let's have a look. This first part looks a lot like this, right? One photon in, and you say this arrow points down, so that is a photon out. Yes, but that is a photon out that happens on the stimulation of a beam, okay? So this process is enhanced by adding this beam to the mix, just like a laser starts shining upon round trips that are having more and more photons in a stimulating beam. You get a stronger and stronger signal. Same is true with here. So this one goes up, this beam comes out faster if there already is a beam present, okay? So this transition is now stimulated, a stimulated transition. This one is not. This photon comes out whenever it wants to. Basically, it's dictated by the quantum field fluctuations, which are very tiny, and therefore the signal in Raman is very small. This, you can ramp up. Now, that's all good and well, but how do you read that information? One way to read that is to send in another photon and wait for this photon to come out. Okay? I excite this state, this photon goes in. The appearance of this photon is a measure for me to know that this transition was successful. The number of photons in the green is an indication of how successful I was in establishing this stimulated transition. This sounds like a, yeah. So in stimulated Raman scattering, you would only focus on this part of the process. By the way, are there any physicists in the audience? Okay. Okay. All right, any case, this, this diagram here is a photon diagram. It's not a field diagram, okay? One photon in, one photon out. This is also a photon diagram, so we can actually compare them. Because in some cases, these diagrams can also indicate fields, in which case this is not a transition but actually is a coherence, okay? So there's a variety of stories going on here. Um, in terms of photons, there's one photon that is going to be absorbed. There's one photon that's going to be extra created under the stimulation process. So I get a loss of this photon and a gain in the number of these photons. If you're able to detect that, the loss and the gain of that process, then you're good too then you were also successful in determining how quickly you have been transferring information from the ground state to the vibrationally excited state. That is more difficult, however, than detecting a photon of a different color. Why? Because I can simply put in a spectral filter and say, I'm only detecting these guys. Here, I have to count the number of photons in the laser beam and determine whether on top of those millions and millions of photons, there's one more or one less. That's more difficult and requires some tricks. You need to modulate the beam and see whether or not that modulation is transferred from one beam to the next. So you can do that, and we'll see a few of examples, but this process is easier because you can simply use a, a filter and a detector to see how many green photons there are. In the end, what they detect is exactly the same. 
information of the molecule, namely the vibrational transition. Okay, here it is. This is a setup you can use for doing this coherent Raman technique. You need a laser, another machine that generates a second color, beam of a second color. You need two colors, right? One is called the pump, the other called the stokes. One up, one down. And then you send those beams into a regular laser scanning microscope, and then you're in principle good to go. Um, let me just skip this. It's too much information. Okay. Um, if you do this kind of technique, then it turns out that it doesn't work exactly the same as a fluorescence microscope. All right. There are very specific, and I, I, I just skimmed over it because we have no time to go into it, but because it is coherent, that means that the phase here in the focus is going to be important. And it turns out, if you look at it carefully, that the signal that you generate will propagate in the forward direction very strongly, and in backward you almost get nothing, especially when the signal of the object is large. Okay, so this is very different from fluorescence. Because fluorescence, it doesn't matter. You excite the fluorophore, it emits forward and backward in equal portions. In this kind of technique, that is not the case. Okay? The signal does not go up in equal portions, up and down. It goes mostly up and very little down. So that's problematic at first sight if you think about tissue imaging. You don't get anything back directly. That's true. However, you get lots of stuff back indirectly through scattering. Okay? So interestingly enough, the fact that the tissue scatters is our saving grace. All right? It distorts the focal volume, yes. It limits our ability to go deep, yes. But without it, we wouldn't see anything from the tissue, or almost nothing. So scattering goes both ways, so to speak. Sometimes it helps you out. Sometimes it makes, a lot of times it makes things worse. So here's an example of coherent Raman uh, imaging in a living animal. This is in a mouse. This is done at video rate, 20 frames per second. And we have tuned here to a vibrational mode, which is the CH stretch, which is a famous mode in coherent Raman, because it is very, uh, it's present at very high quantities in uh, lipids. Lipids are CH2 chains, basically, and so therefore they have a lot of CH2. And if you tune to that mode of the CH2, CH2 vibration, you get very strong signals from those locations. These are basically the little plugs of fat from pores, okay? These are sebaceous glands that are in the dermis of the mouse. This is a mouse tissue, a living mouse. Here's a 3D rendering of a living mouse skin. You see the sebaceous glands about 60 microns below the surface of the stratum corneum. And you can just look at them, you know, uh, without any labels. And uh, you can see specifically the sebaceous gland because it has a lot of lipid. Here's a more of a high res cars image of a sebaceous gland. You can see a lot of structure there. You can see the hair shaft here. That is a non resonant signal from, from keratin, non resonant car signal from keratin. This is the resonant signal from the fat in uh, sebocytes. Okay? Beautiful picture here, chemically specific picture of a, of a sebaceous gland. So you can combine all of this stuff. Okay, remember, we can do already second harmonic, already talked about two photon fluorescence. We just add this one to the mix. We do also coherent Raman. And what we can see is a variety of signals that we can all detect at the same time. All of these things happen in the focal volume at the same time. It's up to us to detect it or not. The green here is NADH, fluorescence from cells. This green is NADH, not NADH, this is elastin fluorescence from a blood vessel. That's collagen from the blood vessel. And these red chunks here is the car signal from adipocytes. This is a piece of kidney tissue. So the nice thing about an image like this is you get all this information without having to apply any labeling. You can still be quite specific about what's going on in your tissues. Okay. Last example. Um, 
An example in uh, terms of cardiovascular disease, to see how we can use those technologies to actually study something and learn something about uh, disease. Uh, this is uh, ath atherosclerosis. You may have heard about it, but what happens, of course, is that lipids through LDL accumulate in the blood vessel wall. Monocytes trying to clean it up, okay? And in doing so, they actually fail. This is a hallmark of creating lesions. The macrophages, the monocytes that turn into macrophages, uh, are unable to digest all of the lipid, which has a lot of cholesterol in there, and basically, they have no mechanism to turn it off. They keep eating till they basically are chock full and have to go through a um, programmed cell death cycle. Okay? So you see uh, apoptosis happens of the macrophages, and when it happens, all their contents, all the stuff that they have been eating, all the lipid and cholesterols, are released along with the cellular debris. This happens right underneath the blood vessel wall. What, this, what the uh, tissue is doing is trying to prevent this debris from spreading and basically caps it off by growing locally a little bit more collagen. That's called a fibrous cap. Okay, so you're good. This fibrous cap sits there and keeps this junk from propagating any further, especially through rupture into the blood vessel wall. However, you cannot be sure that the stuff always will stay there. You see, it's nicely protected. In fact, we all have those lesions, okay? I actually just read an article about people who walk more than four hours or run more than four hours a week, so very healthy people, they still have a truckload of these, of these plaques in their aorta mostly, okay? So you cannot eliminate. This is a characteristic of all of us. But the question is, how strong is this fibrous cap from, uh, how strong is it? to prevent this content from being released in your bloodstream, okay? So in some cases, that is not, uh, uh, not very strong, and so that means that you can, act can actually have rupture, and this content may then go into your bloodstream and cause plugging elsewhere in your body, okay? Either in your brain, stroke, or lead to a heart attack, like clogging up the capillaries. One of the scenarios and why this rupture happens is related to the amount of cholesterol in this plaque. If it's very, very high, then under certain circumstances, this cholesterol can actually crystallize. And there's a school of thought that says, well, these crystallized shards, these microcrystals are sharp, can actually compromise the integrity of this fibrous cap. All right? That's one explanation. There's more, but this is one of them. And uh, if that is true, that certainly is not a good scenario. However, this is, this is highly controversial if, if it's true or not. So we looked at this from uh, you know, our own angle, which is through nonlinear optical microscopy. This is a part of a mouse aorta. You see that there's bright spots, and everywhere there's an orange or yellow spot. That means the lipid concentration is very high. So you see there's lots of little lesions everywhere. If you blow them up, you can have a look inside those lesions. Uh, blow up even more, you see this is what you see. You see basically kind of like blobs of bright signal. It looks pretty amorphous already, right? You don't see a lot of cellular structure here. And some of these structures look actually kind of quasi-rectangular. So just by looking at the morphology, you may argue, ah, there may be some cholesterol crystal in there. So here's a recording. This is a coherent Raman image. You see some structure here. You see a kind of a stripe. Almost looks like a sharp shard. And uh, here you see kind of a almost rectangular looking structure. But you cannot be for sure, but what we can do, since it's vibrational microscopy, we can look at the spectrum, right? And so we can extract the spectrum out of the different areas. So in purple or magenta, you see that shard right there has this spectrum. And the spectrum says, this is not cholesterol, right? This little red stuff up there in the corner has actually a cholesterol spectrum. So that is cholesterol, right? As is this big shard right there. Look, in this rendering, when you look at the, when you decompose the image or segment it in terms of its spectral properties, you see this very sharp, edgy kind of looking 
cholesterol chunk. So that could be cholesterol. Here's another one. Look at this. This looks like a crystal, right? But how do we know for sure? Well, it turns out cholesterol is a chiral molecule, like, like most biological molecules. And if chiral molecules crystallize, they form a non centrosymmetric crystal. That means it should be second harmonic active. So let's bring out the second harmonic signal, and lo and behold, look at that. Beautiful. This, image is, this combination of images is kind of interesting, because you see here some fuzz below, which you also see here. Okay? That is basically unraveled collagen that sits here. Right? So this is protein that gives rise to a second harmonic signal, and that is not protein. That is cholesterol cholesterol, in fact. But it's also interesting is that this little blob right here does not show up there. It's completely dark. Okay? So what we can do now is actually combine this information and try to learn from it. This is the so-called spectral decomposition of this image. And I'll show you the image, the spectra that come with it. This, we expect, is, to, is collagen. And yes, indeed, this is a protein spectrum from our coherent Raman. And the blue is a cholesterol spectrum. So we know this is cholesterol. That is protein. Collagen is what a second harmonic says. But we also see something interesting. We see two pieces of chemically identical material next to one another. However, the second harmonic says, this is crystalline. That's not. This is liquid cholesterol. This is crystalline cholesterol. This is the kind of stuff that is potentially dangerous. This is just liquid, liquid stuff that cannot really poke through the wall. Right? So the ability to see both of these things, of course, is relevant for studying this whole process. So here's our last picture. Hopefully you can see it from the back. It's a little dim. This is a stimulated Raman scattering, which is coherent Raman. We know that this is actually not pure cholesterol. This is cholesterol ester. This is a cross-section of a plaque. OK, so this is basically a cross-section. So we slice the aorta uh, transversely. And what you see is that these chunks are kind of, some of them are poking through the wall almost. Right? So this is kind of an indication, not just a cartoon. This is an actual measurement, ex vivo, but we have indication that, OK, you know, this may actually happen. They're definitely crystalline because the second harmonic says that they are. So this kind of imaging can therefore help to see if this hypothesis actually is true and then can help remedy uh, this problem some way, somehow. All right. Now, there's some outstanding challenges that I'd like to wrap up with. Um, and they, of course, relate to scattering of photons. I mean, these techniques work quite nicely, quite beautifully. And the single most limiting factor is the fact that tissue scatters light and we can't get the photons in far enough or can get them out. Right? So scattering attenuates and distorts the excitation volume. Now, many people have thought about this, and the final word has not been spoken. So can this be understood better in the hopes to solve this problem? Okay? We know a lot about tissues, uh, light scattering in tissues, but maybe not enough to address the issue as it comes to focus microscopy. Focus microscopy relies on making a focal volume. This focal volume is there because light diffracts. Diffraction of light is a wave property. Okay, so you have to understand this problem in terms of wave properties of light. You cannot really approximate light as being a ping pong ball that kind of like bounces through the tissue. This is actually a wave problem, and that makes it a lot more complex. Okay, because now you need to Consider interferences, the amplitude, and the phase of the light, not just its intensity distribution. That requires a better understanding. Then, can those effects be reduced? Hopefully, based on that understanding, is there anything we can do about it? And then, hopefully, with those new pieces of information, can we go deeper and also improve the quality of the image? when you go deeper. All right? So those are issues that are not solved at the moment, or not perfectly solved. 
and you can help think about these issues. Because if you have a solution to this, uh, then I want to marry you. Okay? I'm not sure if that's a motivation, but forget about that last part. You'll be rich and famous. Maybe that's better. <laughs> All right, thanks.